and be deep uh, agreement. Those of you who care about innovation need to care about how you cut, how you reduce spending. We have already cut domestic discretionary spending to its lowest levels since the Eisenhower administration as a percentage of our economy. That is something the President felt was necessary in these extraordinary times. But to cut another 10 or 15 percent, as some do, uh, will make the proposals being suggested to here uh, a mute point. Uh, so uh, uh, I flag that for everyone. The third issue I'll talk about before closing is just is manufacturing. Uh, this administration has made manufacturing a priority, and we are very aware that when you focus on manufacturing, there are some who will take a more classical view, economic view, and say uh, you cannot you cannot have a preference or you cannot care more about any particularly part of the economy because then you're picking winners and losing losers. You, you're putting distortionary deadweight loss on the economy. And I want to make the economic case for why we feel that is not right. First of all, let's consider research and development. Research and development is an area where there is now strong bipartisan support that there are significant spillover benefits that go beyond a particular company doing research and development. We support our, our universities to do basic research. We give the R&D tax credit to our companies because we believe that there is a benefit in innovation and growth that happens to our economy when that happens here that goes beyond the specific benefits of the individual company. And I think that manufacturing for us, uh, uh, done right, done smart, uh, has that same justification. Number one, manufacturing does punch above its weight. 90% of patents, 70% of private sector research, 60% of exports come from manufacturing. Secondly, uh, location matters. Studies show that when a major manufacturing uh, plant comes into an area, the productivity of the, of the, uh, of the, of the nearby manufacturing also goes up. There are positive supply chain and ecosystem impacts that, go, again, go beyond the particular company. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, we have papers on this, but, I, but for those who take more of the knee-jerk review uh, uh, that argument that anything for, that stresses advanced manufacturing or the importance of location is somehow just a political or distortionary economic policy, you should look at the, the uh, increase in strong academic evidence that suggests location does matter and that it is right as a matter of public policy to want uh, uh, to have more manufacturing location in the United States. Note how many companies are moving their production and their design specialists uh, together in the same buildings, on the floor. Why? They think it matters. Uh, uh, Bell Labs, they think it matters to have production and design together, that there is a greater innovation benefit that goes on. The next point, too, which the Professor Spisano and she from Harvard make so well, is that when you have an overall uh, supply chain in manufacturing, when you suffer a period where that uh, manufacturing base is eroded, it is not just a temporary uh, uh, thing. It affects our ability to compete for the next level of high value added pro projects. And their example is in consumer electronics, where it might have seemed at one point that it, did, was, that it was not such a terrible thing if consumer electronics were produced somewhere else uh, with lower cost labor. But what they argue is that that eroded our ability, our base, to compete for what became the more high value added consumer electronics of the future. But if that's the test case for letting your manufacturing base become eroded, then I think we can feel positive that what happened on autos was the opposite side. The fact that the American automobile industry has, was uh, uh, saved or helped save itself with the help of President Obama and, its, and the workers and, and the people there is, is obviously part of our uh, uh, part of a manufacturing success story in the United States now. It may have saved over a million jobs. But I also think it's very important for the future. Nobody doubts that the United States automobile industry is now 
position to compete for the future jobs, which would not have happened had we let that the entire supply chain be, become eroded. I always thought one of the most significant quotes was that from Alan Mullaly at Ford, because everything anybody would have been taught in their macro or microeconomic micro economic, economic class would have been that if you had three main competitors and two of them went out of business, the one standing would have been stronger. They'd be taking more market share uh, uh, and, and, and would be more powerful and broader. It's striking then that Ford Motor Company CEO, Alan Mullaly, said at the time, and I quote, we believe that if GM and Chrysler would have gone into freefall bankruptcy, they would have taken the supply base down and taken the industry down, plus maybe turned the U.S. recession into a depression, close quote. That is a teaching moment about the power of the overall innovative uh, uh, skill set, the supply chain, and what that means for our capacity to compete when the company that would have been left standing thought they might have gone down as well. So uh, there's so much to say. I wanted to make these few points, overall perspective, talk a little bit about manufacturing, about research, and about skills, and I'm very happy to take your questions uh, going forward. Time for a few questions. Uh, I will con people, and if you can wait till the Christine comes around with the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rob Colarina, AIC Investments. We're actually manufacturing investors in 20 states. My question goes to innovation funds, which you brought up. Um, at what stage are you focusing on? Is it uh, with respect to either expansion or is these startups? And then on, a, on an execution basis, what's the regional plan as far as on a national strategy? Um, well, look, I think it, for those of us who are in the gov government job, you, you know, where you do want to be a bit like the classic economic book is you want to look for where we are underinvesting as a country or where we have too little capital as a country uh, going to private sector enterprises where uh, because individual private actors do not feel they get the full benefit from from those investments but we as a country would be richer and in, uh, if there was more investments in those areas and so I think one of the things that we are trying to look at is uh, you know I think the expressions become you know where is where are the valley of deaths meaning where are those places where uh, in the innovative process for companies uh, where they uh, uh, are not able to get the capital they need to be uh, perhaps one of the gazelles, one of the fast-growing companies. And I think the hard part for, for at, at the government level is you have to ask, is it a valley of death because it should be a valley of death? Uh, because it doesn't make sense for the private or the public sector to be investing in companies like that? Or is it a case where there really is uh, a market failure where uh, it may not make sense for uh, particular uh, uh, venture funds to invest in certain companies, but if we had a broader investment, uh, you would have some would prosper and we as a country would be better off. And that's where I think you look for the type of tools you have with the SBIC and other tools to see are there areas where it makes sense, where we as a country uh, maybe care more about how many small manufacturers have a chance to grow and expand, and that even if there's a risk aversion in the capital markets or it's just not the fad or trend of the day, there's a strong enough public purpose for us to go in there. And that's something that you know, we're look, we, we look at, we take very seriously, and it's something that we, we are having discussions with Karen Mills, with Treasury Department about. And so, uh, uh, you know, we plan, we're, we're now going to be around for four more years, uh, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, we're open and eager to get people's suggestions. I will say on the regional uh, strategy, I think one of the, the very uh, strong initiatives the president did put forward was his national innovation uh, uh, hubs proposal. And, and I think what was interesting there was that we proposed a billion dollars so we could do 15 or 20. And when it didn't look like Congress was going to pass that, the president said to us, can't you pull together enough money in the federal government to do one pilot? So we 
did kind of pass the hat and come up with $45 million. When we put that proposal forward, we received 13 partnerships, 13 tremendous collaborations. We were only able to award one. It went to a collaboration in Youngstown where its partners included uh, not just Case Western, but Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. And it is a, uh, the, the excitement about that, and I think also the excitement that you're doing something that's regional, where you have Pennsylvania, Ohio, and the whole Rust Belt stream all investing together instead of the way things typically are, where it's a particular state or a particular, um, uh, uh, a, a particular state or a particular city uh, looking for that. So I think considering that we've tested that, we've seen there was enough interest that 13 partnerships would apply for that. That really shows, I think, the promise of this strategy, which has been used in Germany, of these national manufacturing innovation hubs. Uh, uh, and I think that is something that we're going to look to promote in a second term and expand further. Over here. Uh, thank you. Paul Friedman with Every Child Matters. Uh, we're very, I applaud you for your comments about the need not to have us fighting uh, against uh, you know, money for uh, children versus money for research and other vital needs in the domestic discretionary budget. So the question is, where do we find more revenue? And have you considered uh, taxes on stock transfers or stock transactions or other kinds of innovative uh, carbon taxes? other kinds of approaches where we can find new revenue uh, that won't, uh, that will be possible for us to, uh, to not fight amongst ourselves for uh, important uh, resources. Uh, well, it's going to shock you and many of you to know that I am not here to make uh, news on uh, new <laughs> <Right> revenues. <laughs> um, we are busy fighting right now to make yeah. sure that we have a, a, a budget agreement uh, that is very balanced. And mm -hmm. I think part of that balance is obviously having enough high income revenues together with uh, 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 smart entitlement savings. Uh, that's the type of balance people talk about the most, but the other type of balance is to make sure that you're putting together... The proceedings under the quorum call be vitiated? Without objection. Mr. President, like many millions of Americans, on November 6th, just over a month ago, on Election Day, I stood at the polls, I cast my vote, and then when I got home, I stayed up late to see the results come in. And I was still awake when President Obama delivered his acceptance speech. In those remarks, he said, and I quote, I want to thank every American who participated in this election, whether you voted for the very first time or waited in line for a very long time. And by the way, we have to fix that. There is so much we have to fix. It was 11.38 p.m. on the East Coast when the Associated Press first called the election for President Obama. But Andre Murias, an 18-year-old first-time voter in Miami-Dade County, Florida, was still online waiting to cast his ballot. Andre had been online at South Kendall Community Church for nearly five hours by the time he cast his ballot just before midnight. Five hours. And that's nothing compared to the seven and eight hours long that many other Floridians waited to cast their ballots during the state's condensed early voting period. This is a mess, one voter said. It's chaos. Rochelle Hobbs, another first-time voter, waited five hours in Chesapeake, Virginia. Quote, this is just horrible, Rochelle said. There's no reason it should take this long. Voters across the country had other challenges or problems voting. Voters in Pueblo, Colorado said they checked the box on their touchscreen panel to vote for Mitt Romney, but it kept switching their pick to President Obama. I wonder whether my vote really counted, one Colorado voter said. Other voters in Pennsylvania reported a similar problem, although in that case it was the president for whom they were seemingly unable to vote. Poll watchers in Davidson County, Tennessee, could only stand by as would-be voters saw the very, very long line of people waiting to cast their ballots and drove away. Pressed, I'm sure, by commitments of family or work or others to choose not to spend hours standing on line to exercise that most fundamental of American rights, the franchise, the right to vote. In Philadelphia, longtime registered voters who showed up to cast their ballots discovered their names simply weren't on the rolls anymore. Mr. President, in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in South Carolina, New York, Montana, more than a dozen states experienced some kind of basic breakdown in the administration of their elections in 2012. This is the United States 
The right to vote is fundamental to who we are. It is basic to our democracy. It's in our DNA. We have to get this right. That's why I introduced the Fair, Accurate, Secure, or FAST Voting Act of 2012. The Fair, Accurate, Secure, and Timely Voting Act of 2012. The FAST Voting Act. Along with Senators Warner and Whitehouse, and I'm grateful that Congressman Connolly and Langevin in the House have introduced it and our co-sponsors there. In my view, long lines are simply another form of disenfranchising voters. Running out of ballots is simply another form of voter suppression. Incomplete and inaccurate voter rolls, disregarded voter registrations, misleading phone calls and mailing pieces, things that make it harder for citizens to vote are simply a violation of voters' civil rights. We can and must do better. As widespread as the problem was in 2012, there are also many states that are getting it right. And these states, in my view, continue to be laboratories of democracy from which we should learn. The Fast Voting Act creates a new competitive federal grant program, roughly modeled on Race to the Top, which has encouraged states to pursue reforms in a different field in education. States that demonstrated the most comprehensive and promising reform plans win a greater portion of the grant funding in that model. Instead of spurring reform in the education field, the FAST Voting Act would inspire election reform. This bill authorizes a federal program that would award grants based on how well states improve access to the ballot in at least nine different ways. Through flexible registration opportunities, including same-day registration. Through early voting, at a minimum nine of the ten calendar days preceding an election. Through what's called no-excuse absentee voting. Assistance to voters who don't speak English or have disabilities or visual impairments. Effective access to voting for members of our armed services. Formal training to election officials, including state and county administrators and volunteers. Audited and reduced waiting times at the poorest performing polling stations. And, as we learned given that Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, occurred just a few days close to the election, contingency plans for voting in the event of a natural or other disaster that compels a delay of an election. So these are the big areas, Mr. President, mentioned in this Fast Voting Act. Making it easier to register, making it easier to vote early, making it easier to vote absentee, shortening lines, better preparing for catastrophes, making it easier for Americans to exercise their right to vote. This is a good one, and I think I'm working with a host of civil rights and voter protection groups who work day in and day out on strengthening our electoral process. It encourages states and localities to find new creative and local solutions that other states can learn from. Mr. President, as you know, in my service prior to coming to this body, I was a county executive and long active with NACO, the National Association of Counties. And counties have different roles in different states. There's more than 3,000 counties that spread across our 50 states, but in most states, they are responsible in part for administering elections. Many election officials are county elected officials, and many voter boards are parts of county government. And one of the things I think is best about this bill, this Fast Voting Act of 2012, is that rather than mandating some specific response, it encourages and incentivizes state and local officials to put together plans for how to learn from the lessons of 2012, how to learn from the long lines and the barriers that were put in the place of those who came out to vote and find the best solutions rather than imposing or compelling, incentivizing and leading in a way that I think state and local officials will respond well to and will accept and celebrate. There is strong momentum. Although the election is now more than a month behind us, my hope is that we will continue to focus on the challenges of this last election and fix them before the next. The momentum, well, today, the Pew Conference today and tomorrow on voting in America is bringing together some of our nation's foremost experts and scholars. And for that, we're grateful to the Pew Charitable Foundation. The Judiciary Committee, Mr. President, on which we serve, has a hearing announced this coming week, and I applaud Chairman Leahy and Senator Durbin in highlighting the need to get to the bottom of what happened in 2012 and in championing the need for reform. Other members of this body have introduced bills as well, Senators Gillibrand and Boxer, 
and I look forward to learning from them what their proposals are and working more closely with them to harmonize our bills and make sure we have the best approach moving forward. If I can, Mr. President, I'll make just one last point. In addition to serving on the Judiciary Committee, I'm the chair of the African Affairs Subcommittee of the Foreign Relations Committee. And in that role, I advocate for free and fair elections with African leaders every day. The United States is often cited as their role model. We need to act like it, and we need to earn it. What kind of message are we sending to electoral commissions, to heads of state, to members of civil society, and advocates for free, fair, and open elections in the rest of the world when we so visibly and publicly fail to deliver on that promise here in our own country? What kind of message are we sending to Andre Murias, a first-time voter? What kind of message are we sending to Rochelle Hobbs? What kind of message are we sending to first-time voters about the value of their right to vote, for whom so many fought, worked, struggled, sacrificed, even died in the course of our history? What message do we send to them when we allow modern-day barriers to be put in their place? Voting is a fundamental civil right. And when states prevent their citizens from exercising that right, whether deliberately through law or through regulations or accidentally through lack of preparation or mere incompetence, it is a violation of voters' civil rights. The Fast Voting Act, Mr. President, is one critical way we can try to fix our elections and make sure what happened across our country in 2012 never happens again. Thank you. Mr. President. Senator from Maine. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, last week I came to the floor and was honored to give tributes to some of our departing colleagues. Tonight I'm going to take advantage of this time to pay tribute to two other outstanding senators colleagues and friends of mine whom I will miss greatly. They are Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson and Senator Scott Brown. Mr. President, in her marvelous book entitled American Heroines, The Spirited Women Who Shaped Our Country, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson wrote the following. No history can be written appropriately without acknowledging the part women have played in building the greatness of our country, end quote. As my valued colleague and good friend begins a new chapter in her life, I hope that she finds the time to add a new chapter to her own book one that will be fascinating, inspiring, and autobiographical. Like the women that Kay celebrates as an author, from Amelia Earhart to Sally Ride, from Clara Barton to Condoleezza Rice, Kay Bailey Hutchinson is a pioneer, a breaker of barriers. In the special election in 1993, the people of Texas made her the first woman to represent them in the United States Senate. In the three regular elections since then, they have confirmed their trust in her by ever-increasing margins. As the leader of the Senate Commerce Committee, Kay has been a strong voice for transportation systems that are efficient, safe, and secure. In my own work on the Homeland Security Committee, I'm well aware of the major role that she played in drafting the airline security bill that Congress passed after the attacks on 9-11-01. She's also worked successfully to include more effective air cargo screening. From the America Competes Act to her steadfast support for NASA, Kay is determined that our country will not cede its position as the world's leader in science, 
technology, and space exploration. When the NASA rover Curiosity thrilled all of us with its perfect landing on Mars this past August, the hands of Kay's legislative leadership were on the controls. Working with Kay as a member of the Appropriations Committee, I know just how dedicated she is to ensuring that taxpayers' dollars are spent wisely and efficiently. She is a champion for our small business owners and for policies that promote free enterprise and job creation. Her complete commitment to the men and women of our armed forces is reflected in her years of service on the Armed Services Committee as well as the Military Construction Subcommittee on Appropriations and her unanimous selection this year to serve as chairman of the Board of Visitors at West Point. Mr. President, in the afterword to his, her book, Kay wrote that as a young girl growing up in Texas, she was so inspired by the lives of great Americans that by the sixth grade, she had exhausted all of the biographies on the school library shelf and had to turn elsewhere for book report material. I'm sure that the story of her own contributions and accomplishments will be avidly read by generations of girls and boys to come. And I wish her all the best as she turns a new page in what has truly been a remarkable life of public service. Mr. President, when Scott Brown, a fellow New Englander, came to the Senate two years ago, I immediately saw in him those traits shared by the people of our two New England states. A strong work ethic, a determination to always do what he thought was right, and a spirit that was independent and dedicated to doing what was best for his constituents and for his country. My initial assessment was confirmed by our time working together on so many issues. Scott conducted his inspiring 2010 campaign via his now legendary pickup truck and when he got to Washington, he kept his foot on the gas. His work in government at the state and local level in Massachusetts and his distinguished service in the Army National Guard prepared him with experience that made him a respected and effective legislator from day one. His intellect, energy, and character made him a valued colleague and a dear friend. Scott is the person one could always count on. I've had the opportunity to work closely with Scott on so many key issues. In each and every case, he brought an informed, thoughtful, and open-minded approach to every issue. As the ranking member of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, I have gotten to know Scott very well, and I appreciate his service on our committee. He placed his top priority on helping to keep our nation safe from the continuing threat of terrorism. He also worked hard to make our federal government more efficient and transparent. With Scott's leadership, the Senate passed bipartisan legislation to help put the Postal Service back on a more sound financial footing and to ensure that this institution could endure. 
He also authored the Stock Act, the new law that clearly prohibits insider trading by members of Congress and their staff. Scott has long been an effective champion for our small business owners, working to ensure that entrepreneurs and innovators in Massachusetts and across the country have the ability to survive and thrive, and most of all, to create good jobs. He has advocated for our nation's veterans through the Hiring Our Heroes Act that he co-authored which provides tax credits to small businesses that hire a returning veteran or a member of the National Guard or Reserve. Scott has been a devoted advocate in the Senate for fiscal responsibility and a balanced budget amendment. At the same time, he kept a firm commitment to helping those most in deed he fought hard for such vital programs as the low-income heating assistance program, so important to getting through those cold New England winters. Equally important to Scott's hard work in the Senate has been the approach he has always taken in legislating. He studies the issues. He seeks areas where a consensus can be found. And from the very first day in the Senate, he demonstrated his belief that compromise is not a dirty word, but an absolute necessity if we are to meet the challenges facing America. Scott always looked at the issues before Congress, not through the lens of a partisan politician, but rather through the lens of a pragmatic problem solver. Scott's tenure in the Senate has been far too brief, but perhaps more important, it has been characterized by a remarkable degree of success in transforming good ideas into public laws. Given his main roots and his strong commitment to Massachusetts, I am sure that we will remain good friends in the years to come. But oh, Mr. President, how I will miss serving with my friend, Scott Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, Delaware. Mr. President, today is Human Rights Day, and I wanted to simply add my voice to the many others who have spoken up today about the important things that the United States can do to continue our leadership around the world as a country that holds itself accountable and leads others towards being accountable for a world in which human rights have meaning and have substance. There are two things that we can do between now and the end of this calendar year that will make a significant contribution to human rights and to the United States global leadership. First, the House of Representatives can take up and pass VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization bill passed months ago by this chamber, a strong, broad, sensible reauthorization bill that I think well deserves consideration and passage by the other chamber. And second, TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act needs to be reauthorized. I was proud last month to join with Senator Portman and with you, Senator Blumenthal, as the three of us jointly funded, excuse me, founded the Caucus to End Human Trafficking. Slavery exists in the world today. In this country and around the world, there are victims of human trafficking whose voices demand to be heard. And by reauthorizing TVPA, this chamber, this country, can make a meaningful contribution towards ending trafficking in persons in the United States and around the world. So, Mr. President, I simply wanted to add today, on Human Rights Day, those two simple calls for action so that this body, this Congress, this country can continue our global leadership. Take up and pass VAWA, 
the House of Representatives, take up and pass TVPA reauthorization to the United States Senate, and together let us continue to make history in America's leadership on human rights. Thank you, and with that I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Maine. Mr. President, I would suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
The pending business here in the Senate is whether to extend a guarantee on bank deposits beyond the original $250,000. The Senate had scheduled a vote on whether to move forward with the bill at 5.30 Eastern time today, but because of bad weather, senators are having difficulty in getting back to Washington, so that vote has been postponed till tomorrow. Coming up in about 15 minutes on C-SPAN, a political scientist, James Pearson, will speak. He has a theory that the U.S. has had three major political revolutions. Uh, first, uh, when Thomas Jefferson became president in 1800, then the Civil War, and finally the New Deal. And he argues that the U.S. right now is on the verge of a fourth political revolution. You can see him live on C-SPAN coming up in about 15 minutes. On this morning's Washington Journal, we were continuing our discussion on the fiscal cliff, automatic spending cuts and tax increases that would take place in January. Here's a look. Our series looking at different parts of the so-called fiscal cliff talks, and today we want to focus on sequestration, what it means for the Pentagon. Joining us now is Robert Levinson. He's a senior defense analyst at Bloomberg Government. Mr. Levinson, let's just begin with what does sequestration mean? Well, sequestration is kind of a funny term. I think if you Googled it a couple of uh, maybe six or eight months ago, you'd have something about coal and carbon. But today <laughs> it means sort of these automatic cuts that go into effect as a result of last year's Budget Control Act. And basically because Congress can't, and the President can't work something out, these automatic cuts go into place and they're known as sequestration. So give us a little bit more history. I mean, how did this come about? Where is it headed? Right. It came about because of last year's Budget Control Act. You'll recall that there was a crisis sort of over raising the debt ceiling. And there were the, uh, particularly the Republicans in Congress demanded some cuts. And the President and the Congress agreed to about $1 trillion in cuts. And then they handed over another $1.2 to $1.5 trillion to what was called the Super Committee. And because that Super Committee failed to come up with a deal that could be approved, by Congress and the President, these automatic cuts go into effect, which is about $1.2 trillion over 10 years, um, split between defense spending and non-defense spending pretty evenly. And the first cuts will go into effect on January 2nd of 2013. So um, how are the, the, de the defense sequestration cuts being applied? Do we know? Well, we're not exactly sure, but the law, which harkens back to a law from the 1980s, the Graham Rudman Hollings Bill, says that every program, project, and activity must be cut by the same percentage. Now, it's not always clear what program, project, and activity 
means and there may be some flexibility but the understanding is generally that you have to sort of go across the board and cut everything by the same amount. Right now that amount is estimated by the Office of Management Budget to be about 9.4 percent in the Pentagon's case. So what's on the table? for the Pentagon? What, what gets cut across the board? Well, basically, everything, uh, everything can be cut. However, the President has the power to exempt military personnel, and he's indicated he will do that. And that's basically the salaries and other forms of direct compensation of military men and women in uniform. But everything else is basically on the table, all the weapon systems, operations and maintenance accounts, including even though you protect the service members' salaries, a lot of the services that go to them, for instance, health care, is part of the operations and maintenance budget, and that's on the table as well. Yeah, and then there's procurement. What does that mean? Procurement is the things the Pentagon buys, basically the big weapon systems as well as smaller amounts of equipment. And again, yeah, all those programs like the F-35 fighter jet, or the Virginia class submarine for the Navy, those are on the table as well. Military construction, that's on the table. What does that mean? Well, military construction is just the money that the military spends to build the bases and various other facilities that it has, and that, of course, is also on the table. And then you have R&D, test and evaluation. Is that big money? Um, yeah, that can be big money. Um, you know, before weapon systems are often built, there's a whole research and development phase that the Pentagon uh, funds and those dollars are also on the table. Let's talk about what's not on the table. Well, particularly the big thing is the military personnel that's uh, basically not on the table. Military retirement, which is mandatory spending, that's not on the table. The pensions that go to uh, military men and women who've retired from the military, disability payments and things like that, those are not on the table. But uh, everything else basically in the Pentagon budget is pretty much on the table. Well, for what's not on the table, no base closures. Right. They can't close bases, and that's because of the law. The law says that sequestration cannot result in a base closure. They could downsize a base. They could, you know, close units and things like that, but they actually can't technically close a base. That would require, similar to what we had in the past, uh, base realignment and closure commission, and Congress would have to approve any base closures. And the last bullet point that we're showing our viewers, funding for war in Afghanistan, not on the table. Well, it technically is. However, the Pentagon has said that, look, they'll move money around if they have to. There's, it was thought that there originally was an exemption for funding in Afghanistan, and that is not the case. However, the Pentagon has said, look, we're going to get everything we need to the troops in Afghanistan as long as they're there fighting. So they'll, if they have to, they'll move money around in order to ensure that the troops have what they need. If automatic spending cuts go through for the Pentagon. Who makes the decisions about what gets cut? Well, initially, the Office of Management and Budget is going to help craft what the, the President will deliver, which is called a sequestration order. And it will say, here is the percentage, and here's how you have to cut. And it will probably give some interpretation of what they mean by program, project, and activity. And it may mean different things in different areas. For example, in procurement, it will probably mean every weapon system sort of equally. But in operations and maintenance accounts, which are much more flexible, there it could give the Pentagon a lot of latitude to sort of decide where they want to cut things and sort of rob Peter to pay Paul or protect high priority things and uh, cut lower priority things. So sequestration, if it goes through, in 2013, we're talking about $109 billion in budget cuts for the Pentagon for that year, right, for 2013? No, no, no. It's, it's $109 billion is split between the Pentagon and non-defense spending. Oh, right. So about $54.7 billion is the number right. for the so Pentagon. $54.7 billion, and we're showing our viewers that. What impact do you think that has? Well, first of all, we looked at it. A lot of this money wouldn't actually be spent in 2013, so you have to sort of dial it back a little bit. It's probably, of the 54.7, it's probably about $30 billion that will actually be felt. But there will be some impact. For instance, like I mentioned, health care. If you do the numbers, it's about $3 billion that you have to take out of military health care. Now, you're not cutting the people, so you still have the same number of people to serve. I talked to the senior health officials at the Pentagon, and they said there's no good way to do this. Um, they'll probably see if they can make more of that burden fall on retired military personnel as opposed to the active duty. But it's questionable. There definitely will be an impact, particularly in those oper operations and maintenance accounts, because that money is spent sort of every year right away. Research and development or some of those procurement things, that money is often spread out over a very long number of years. So you don't feel the pain quite as quickly as you do in the operations and maintenance area. We're talking with Robert Levinson, who's an analyst for Bloomberg government, about sequestration, what it means for the Pentagon. Republicans dial 202-585-3881 with your questions. Democrats 202-585-3880. Independents, all others, 202 585 
303-382. And uh, we have a special line set aside for those in the military and defense industry, 202-585-3883. First phone call here for Rob Levinson. Glenn in Lancaster, California, independent caller. Go ahead, Glenn. Hi, Greta. Morning. Uh, you know, Obama just did an executive order for people that don't even belong in the United States to get free health care medical schooling. And there's another thing. They're, they're, the cartel sent them here, and they're bringing drugs, crystal meth, heroin, and bad drugs into the United States. We need to cut them off our welfare systems. They need to stop paying interpreters for them. They need to learn our languages and wait in line and not make any cuts to our military. We need them. Put them on our border and, and in our schools and our hospitals and send these people home. Thank you for your time. All right. So a national security issue, these pending cuts, is it that? Well, it certainly has an impact. I think there's been some hyperbole about this dramatic impact. Like we're saying, we're talking about 9.4% in 2013. Um, that's significant for the Pentagon. I think the, the more significant factor is not so much the amount as this across-the-board notion. You're really robbing the Pentagon of the ability to sort of make decisions about where would be most prudent to cut. Uh, and cutting everything across the board, that's the real sort of damaging part of the sequestration. Okay. And, and, it's, and we've, we've shown you this, but here is a, another graphic um, from CQ, Fiscal 2013 Defense Sequester. Estimated distribution by account for the year 2013, that overall number, about $55 billion, and then the percentage of the different um, areas that could be cut if this goes through. So we'll hear from Pat next in uh, South Carolina, Republican caller. Go ahead, Pat. Yes. Um, my husband spent, yes, good morning. My husband spent 21 years in the Navy. And every year on the ships, they were ordered to push equipment off into the ocean so that they could get an increase in their budget to buy more stuff for the next year. We're buying tanks that we don't need, that we don't, our military doesn't even use. I believe that the Pentagon could save a lot of money if they would do better buying power and teach their guys to save instead of throwing it in the ocean. Rob Levinson. Um, well, you mentioned better buying power. That's actually the name of a Pentagon initiative. There's, everybody recognizes that the Pentagon's budget, which has gone up consistently since I think about 1998, and particularly a lot in the past 10 years with the two wars we've been fighting, the Pentagon budget is coming down, whether it's sequestration or something else. And there's a lot of initiatives in the Pentagon to really buy a lot smarter. Um, there is a feeling that there has been some waste when you're flush with cash, you don't have to make hard decisions. And now the Pentagon is looking for a lot of those ways to uh, you know, lower their buying costs and get more value for the taxpayer's dollar. When you look at major weapon systems that could see some uh, scaling back in spending, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, uh, the Predator and Reaper drone aircraft, Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, the Virginia-class attack submarine, talk about these weapon systems. Well, for instance, the F-35, that's the largest program in Pentagon history. Um, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps are all buying versions of this jet. It's going to, the procurement goes out like 20 years. There's a total of, I think, uh, for the United States, a couple of thousand of these aircraft. A lot of foreign partners are buying this. It's a very expensive jet, and there have been some delays and some cost overruns with the program. And there's a lot of talk that maybe uh, that program will need to be scaled back anyway. There's uh, some skepticism on some of the partners. There's some rumors out of Canada that perhaps the Canadians are reconsidering their purchase of the F-35. Uh, that's not confirmed yet, and it's uh, still uh, sort of an open question. But there's a lot of skepticism because this program is huge, and it has been somewhat delayed, and uh, there have been cost overruns. Mike in Norwood, Connecticut, on our line for those in the military defense industry. Go ahead, Mike. Um, hi. Yeah. So I work for a small business, and all we do is defense um, manufacturing, basically and just wanted to call in. I agree that the costs get out of control. Procurement is an issue. Um, for instance, we try to sell, uh, or we get solicited to sell one bolt for a repair uh, kit, and I offer them a minimum buy of 
let's say three hundred dollars and the buyer only needs one but i offer him ten for three hundred dollars he'll still buy one because that's just the way their systems are set up so it's really why, hard to why that would you know why that is mike uh my guess is because they don't have it costs money for them to uh, inventory the nine that they didn't need. So I'm guessing there's cost everywhere, and that might be the one that they're looking at, saying, no, we can't inventory that. You know, there, there's only so much warehousing space. So, so, Mike, let me ask you this. Is it because of that, does your company, other companies, think we always have to have a minimum buy? We, we do that because of contract requirements. There's shipping and uh, military packaging with barcoding and RFID and, and it goes on and on and on. So we have to cover ourselves in case the contract requires us to ship a part to uh, another country or in a base in another country. So there's a lot of things involved in it and that's why it's so non-cost effective. So, so Rob Levinson, uh, excuse me, um, I'm going to turn to Rob Levinson in a minute, but, but Mike, do you think that more often than not your company makes money? Uh, I would say it's a 50-50. A lot of times we lose out, but we do make up for it in other areas, and you have to, you have to keep that balance going and follow that line. Okay. All right. Rob Levinson, what did you hear from that caller? Well, uh, he you know, he's right. There's, the Pentagon is the largest bureaucracy in the world in some ways. You know, it spends over a half a trillion dollars a year. And sometimes they have a lot of rules and things and mechanisms in place that probably do cause a lot of waste. You know, the Pentagon can't even be audited yet. They're supposed to prepare for an audit, and that's been very difficult. In some cases, it's very hard to keep track of all this money. And yeah, there are various rules and various crazy things that go on that don't seem to make a lot of sense. And like I say, I think in the era where the budget starts coming down, people begin to take a lot harder look at all of these things, and the Pentagon will try and fix some of these. Of course, it won't fix all of them. It's still going to be big and spend an awful lot of money, and there's going to be inefficiencies and waste in the system. In the Washington Times commentary section, Colonel Ken Allard writes this morning, uh, he's retired from the Army and uh, was the staff director for the Department of Defense Acquisition Reform Panel. And he notes that when they looked into the procurement system, uh, that they found...